My guest tonight writes the current column for the International Herald Tribune and the New York Times Online. His new book is called India Calling, an Intimate Portrait of a Nation's Remaking. Please welcome to the program, Anand Girdadas. Hello, sir. Please. Nice to see you. Great to be here. Thank you for joining us. The book is called India Calling. Uh, it's amazing. You, you were born in... Cleveland, Ohio. What, Sha are those Shaker Heights or is that? Suburb of Cleveland. Suburb of, yeah. of Cleveland and, and Shaker Heights. Your parents, first generation. Uh, you decide at 21 to go back to India to do what? I thought, you know, as a child I had grown up hating India because it was this kind of stagnant, dead, stifling country. And sometime in, when I was in college, I realized that something had changed and I hadn't kind of kept up to date with it and that the country they left was maybe something that I needed to go and understand. So I moved back uh, right after uh, I finished college. Now, do you feel like India had changed dramatically or also your perception of it, or is it uh, uh, somewhere in the middle? It's the overlap of the two. Mm -hmm. I think when you're a child, the only thing you don't want is to be different from people. So a lot of immigrants deal with this immigrant first-generation families, and kids kind of push that away, and I push it away. Uh, and it was partly just that, and it was partly where India was in the world at that stage. No one was putting it on the covers of magazines. No one was talking about it as a great superpower. No one was giving it state dinners in Washington. Uh, so it was a place that felt to me like better not to be from. And by the time I was in college, you become more secure, all of those things. And also, India had changed. It had actually right. changed on the ground. How'd your parents, had they changed? Because I'm just imagining, okay, I'm the son, my, my grandparents immigrated to this country. If I had told them I was going back to the place they had worked so damn hard to get out of, <laughs> uh, passive aggression would have been on the menu. It would have been, sure, go back, why not? You know. I'm fine, you, I'm fine. I'm fine, <laughs> just put a dagger through my skull. <laughs> uh, did, did you receive any pushback from your parents? Not much until the day my sister was working at Google at the time mm -hmm. in California, and I was already out in India, and she got an opportunity to potentially do the same thing. And I think that the prospect of a double whammy was too much. <laughs> and a kind of reverse immigration double whammy. And she IM'd me one day and said, what are Papa and I doing here? Uh, and that was the only moment. And then she, it never really came up again. But she kind of wondered, what are we doing here if we have done everything uh, they to came move to, this to, way? They came to live the American dream. You were the embodiment of their American dream. And you were now going back because the American dream was still alive. It was just alive in India. <laughs> That's the confusion. That's the confusion. <laughs> what, what did you find, uh, uh, you know, India's caste system has always it, it seemingly been the, the bulwark against the type of upward mobility that you're talking about. I, is that gone now? It's funny, you know, it, the Indians used to always complain that caste was the only thing that anybody said about them. And yet it was, a, it was like race in this country, the most profound fact about the place. And in a way, if you think about the idea behind caste, it is that it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, your father and grandfather and all of their positions all the way up control that. If anything is changing in today's India, it is the lack of belief peop in this idea. People right. are rejecting this belief. People are believing that you should get where you are based on what you do, not who you are. Uh, and that is a profound revolution that is happening one Indian at a time. You, you talk about this guy in the book, Ravindra? Ravindra. Ravindra. Uh, he is a character so motivated, uh, so industrious, he's the type of guy that you would imagine would have been on the first plane out to America 20 years ago, but he's choosing to stay now in India and use his industry there. Is that, he what, is. Did that surprise he, you to see guys like that? He is the classic self-made man, and as you say, uh, he would have probably done that self-making in New Jersey or California a generation ago. He was born in a village in India, uh, bumped up against the limitations of being from that village, and through an extraordinary run of effort of self-education through all these hole-in-the-wall classes, pulled himself out. And at the end of that journey, not only did he not want to go to America, which he didn't, he didn't even want to go to Bombay or Delhi, the biggest cities in India. And I said, why? And he said, when you come from where I come from, the lowest of the low, it's not just money you want. You want dignity. You want people to respect you and know you and say sir to you. And so what he wanted was to go from that village to the nearest town where he had more opportunity, but where he was still big by the standards of the town. He didn't right. want to get lost in America or even in, in the bigger cities of India. As, as you watch the change taking place, 
uh, in your mind coming from Shaker Heights, Ohio and, and going to India, do you, do you think America can still kick their ass or what do you, what do you, where are you, where are we at now? Are we still in an ass kicking I had a different capacity? answer for Colbert, but for you, I'm going to tell you the <laughs> truth. <laughs> 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 You get the real deal. All right, let me hear it. Break it down. When, you, when we talk about this, when we talk about India, we talk about China in this country, we talk about an economic threat. We're all obsessed with econo emerging markets, right, all right. of this, right? The same thing with China. I think the real thing Americans need to think about is these countries pose a challenge of culture and spirit. Because if you just look at the segment you did on the culture and discourse in this country, we are all pulling each other down. We've, we've, we're creating a culture of destruction and pulling each other down. Mm. And India and China, for all of the work that lies ahead for them, are starting to create cultures of hope and cultures of creation, where there's a consensus on saying, how do we create something right. extraordinary? And, and we need to be worried we'll not about an together. economic tre threat, but the threat of that spirit in about two and a half billion people. May I? May I sum up the interview? Please. The song. <laughs> <clears throat> United we stand, divided we fall. <laughs> And if I, uh, <laughs> India Calling, it's a great book. It's on the bookshelves now. Unendeared it off.